The second book of Samuel, session 42. Let's continue with chapter 23. We ended yesterday with David longed for a drink from the water of the well, from the well in Bethlehem. And his three mighty men went to fetch the water for him, not thinking about their own lives. And David said, no, I cannot drink this. And he poured it out as an offering unto Yahuwah. And David continues in verse 17 and he says, Be it far from me, O Yahuwah, that I should do this. Do what? What are you talking about, David? This is hugely prophetic for me anyway. He said, I will not do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their own lives? Therefore, I will not drink it. You know, he was looking at the water from the well, that beautiful, sweet, fresh water from Bethlehem. He was looking at this water in a, in a cup or in a holder that these three men ran, you know, through enemy lines and they brought it and they bowed before David and they, they offered it up to him. And he looked at this water and he said, this is the blood of the three men. No, it's not blood, it's water. Can you see, you know, even I'm always asking for the please help me to make sure that I'm not preaching rubbish. <laughs> I'm always seeing prophecy in absolutely everything. But I mean, David is looking at water and yet he sees blood. Why? Because the water represents the sacrifice, the willingness, the lives of these three mighty end day warriors, loyal servants of the king of Israel. He looks at the water and he sees so much more. He sees how these three men will not hesitate a second to let their blood be poured out. And just as if it is blood that is poured out um, together with the whole sacrificial system of dying, being willing to die in the place of somebody else, be willing to die for God's kingdom to come, be willing to die for God's name, be willing to die for your king to be rightfully on the throne, and also to be willing to die just to give your king a drink of water, just to hear, because not everybody hears what King David said. I mean, you know, I want to be king and I want to have um, my whole country free and I want my people to be prosperous. Those are big things. This was seemingly small. I just want a sip of Bethlehem's water from the wells because that is precious to me. Bethlehem represents the birthplace of the Messiah, the king of the world, the king of the earth, the son of God, whom God has anointed as king. And that king's heart's desire is a sip of water, not any water, but from his hometown, from, from there where the foundation of his covenant and his kingdom is. You know, so so this is the heart's desire of the king. And these end day warriors, these valiant men and women that is represented by these three men, they will let even their blood be poured out to give a king, their king, his heart's desire. This is the huge picture. This is a massively deep picture that David is prophesying here, looking into a cup of water and seeing these end day saints who are willing to let their life blood, the water, I mean, without water, there's no life. Without blood, there's no life. And they are willing to let that be poured out as a drink offering. And in the prophetic, um, you know, David is talking about these beautiful end day saints that we also find in Hebrews 11, talking about the fathers of our faith, but how without their valiant, unselfish, um, courageous service, instead, instead of worrying about their own lives, they worry about the king and his kingdom more than anything else, and how these valiant soldiers and 
huge men of faith of Hebrews 11, how the work that they've started will be finished by us. Hebrews 11 verse 33. These men, right through faith, they subdued kingdoms. They brought righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Wow. Out of weakness, they were made strong. Remember, David said, Your, what did he say to Yahuwah? Your kindness has made me strong. And th- this is also prophetic. They vexed valiant in fightings and in battles. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens and the enemies. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, not um, accepting compromise, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. They were willing to be tortured and killed because they, they, they rather want to be resurrected with their king and be in their king's kingdom than have deliverance in this lifetime. Others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, beatings. Yes, some of them even in bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, tormented. You think about even King David and all the men that was with him, all the years of wandering in the wilderness, afflicted, tormented, persecuted, cruel, mockings, unf- unfair. Hebrews eleven thirty eight. This world is just not worthy of these men and women. Same as with these three. They, they were so precious to David, to God's kingdom. The world is not worthy of them. Are you and I valiant end-time warriors? They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. Tell me that I'm wrong to say that through David's life and his men's life, we are not seeing this picture of faithful servants and believers all throughout the ages up to the end. And all of these having obtained a good report through their faith, have not received the promise yet. God having provided some better thing for us, so that they, you know, historically, without us, now in the future of which King David has been prophesying about, we will not be made perfect. We will not be made perfect without them, And they will not be made perfect without us. When will we be made perfect? All of us at the second resurrection, when our son of David, when the king is enthroned on the throne of righteousness and is finally subduing all enemies under his feet and he rules and reigns from the city of David on the throne of David, then all of us who are alive and all of those who were dead will be made perfect together. So we see in them an absolute example for us to follow here in the end. This also correlates with Revelation 6 verse 9 and onwards. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were killed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And I cried with a loud voice and said, How long, O Father Yahuwah, holy and true, Are you not going to judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? But white robes were given unto them, and it was said unto them that they should rest. You know, they were sleeping under the altar in the grave. You have to do the rest of my studies to know that under the altar is on earth in the grave. Long story. They should rest for a little season longer until when their fellow servants also and their brothers also should be killed as they are, and then God's revenge will be fulfilled. You see how the absolute correlation with Hebrews 11 is fulfilled here. And then it always, always, always takes me back 
to Daniel 11. Everything just wants to take me back to Daniel 11, where it says that they who know their God will be strong and they will do fantastic, valiant, end-time warrior works in the end days. Yet they will fall by the sword, flame, captivity and spoil. But their testing is to purge them and to make them white. You take a red pen and draw a line from Hebrews 11 to Revelation 6 to Daniel 11 back to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Continuing, and Abishai, Abba of Jesse, Abba, Abba Shah, Abba Jess. Abishai, that's the two root words in the Hebrew. It means Abba is our gift that we agree with. And Abishai, the brother of Jahab, the son of Zeruah, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against three hundred, and he slew them, and had the name among three. So here, Abba, who is our gift, you know, the brother of Ya'ab, Yahuwah, is our Abba, the son of Zeruiah. Um, he's one of these three. And how does he, you know, as one of the three, represent the end day warriors? His name is Abba, his gift. He's the brother of Yahuwah, our Abba. And he's the son of Zeruiah, which means to be cracked or to be wounded. Can you see? Ah, oh, to be wounded for God, like Daniel 11, like Hebrews 11, like Revelation 6. You'll be an end-time warrior. You are chief among the three. These three end-day warriors are representing the entire end-day army of Yahuwah, being willing to be wounded, going through the enemy lines. I don't care. I'm going to fetch the water for my king from the well of Bethlehem. Was he not the most honorable of three? And therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not unto the first three. So he wasn't there from the beginning, but he became the captain of the three. But he wasn't necessarily attained unto them firstly. So you grow in your faith and in your willingness. And if we continue, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Gabzil, who had done many acts, and he slew, listen to this now, two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. All right, people always want to say, you know, your uh, fables and fairy tales and Nephilim stories are not true. So God is so faithful. He tells us that this man, Bana Yah, Yah is my builder. Yah builds up. The builder Yah, Bana Yah, the son of Yaho Yada, the son of a valiant man of Gabzil. He did many great things, but one of what well, two of the great things he did was he killed lion like men and he killed a lion. So when we say this man killed two lion-like men, a um, hybrid, uh, a mixture, genetic mixing of the Nephilim that has still remained through the ages, half man, half lion. When they say you're crazy when you say this, God is, <laughs> he's got a sense of humor. Just for in case people want to be an idiot and tell us there wasn't anything like half lion, half men. These were just two lions that um, Benaya killed, or these were just two normal men that Benaya killed. God specifically said, this is lion-like men, and later on, he also did kill a lion, you know, a normal lion, but the lion-like men were not as the normal lion. Otherwise, God could have said, he killed three lions. So interesting, these two lion-like men, are they normal? You know, they've got the strength of lions. And this man, God is my builder, was willing, courageous, and uh, self-sacrificing enough to stand in and say, you Nephilim, I'm not going to let you live. You stand against my, my king and the kingdom of Israel. And he killed them. But he also wasn't scared to go in the snow. 
down into a pit to kill a normal lion. What the circumstances was, he doesn't say. And he also slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. What, what does it mean, a goodly man, a gibor man, a giant of an Egyptian? And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he, you know, Benaya, went down to him with a staff, and he plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and he slew him with his own spear. And this whole Egyptian sun god, uh, pyramid with a one dollar eye, this whole Nephilim genetic serpent seed mixture, end day, Babylonian New World Order system kingdom. The Bible says they grave, they uh, dig a pit for others to fall in. And they're going to end up falling in that pit themselves. Benaya took this Egyptian spear with which he, as a giant, rules and reigns and brings fear amongst all the people. He took that spear and he killed the Egyptian with his own spear. So there you have it. You know, what you sow, you'll reap in day. Rebellion once, kings of the earth against God. You're going to row what you're seeping. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he had a name among the three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty men, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. So David made Benaiah, who also wasn't from the beginning part of the first three, he made him his guardian. Guardian of what? Guardian of truth. You know? Guardian of the true word of God. Guardian against the Babylonian mixing of lion genetics with human genetics. Guardians over the kingdom and the protection and the jealousy of King David's kingdom. Are you one of these guardians? Are you Benaya building, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem with Yah? And then we had Azahel, the brother of Joab. He was one of the thirty. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem. Shema, the Herodite. Elika, the Herodite. Heles, the Palatite. Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Tekoite. Abiezer, the Anetotite. Mebunahi, the Hushatite. Yes, I am going to read all these men's names. Because Hebrews 11 said these valiant forefathers of our faith. The world is not worthy of them. The world doesn't even know about them, but they were amazing. They were valiant fighters in the kingdom of David. Therefore, they represent the valiant fighters in the kingdom of David. David, the beloved, the son of David, Yeshua, the son of God, God the Father, God our King, who made his son prince and king over all because they are one and together the kingdom belongs to them and these mighty men whom David said, you know, I see what you do for me. Thank you, my good and faithful servants. And your biggest sacrifice that you were willing to go fetch this water for me, I'm going to pour out as an offering to Yahuwah. Because ultimately, you serve Yahuwah, don't you? We had Abiezer, Mebunahi, Zalmon, Maharahi, Helib, Netufatite, Itahi, um, Benaya, Hidahi, Abi Albon, Asmaveth, Elihaba, Shamadi Haratite, Ahahim, Elifelet, uh, Eliam, Hezrahi, Ba'arai, Igal, Bani, Zelek, Nahari, Ira, Garib, and Uriah, the Hittite. Thirty-seven in all. These were the amazing men, really standing head and shoulders above the rest of the army. Of course, the whole army served Jehua. Of course, the whole army served David. Yes, they were split, but they came back together again. And David loves his people, and he wants to save all his people. But they were out of those, out of all the camp of Israel. These 30 men were David's valiant men. 
And out of these 30, there were the three that risked even their very own lives. And so this always takes us back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. You have the whole camp in their tents, but you only have the priests willing or able to come right into the holy place, into the tabernacle to do all the hard work there. And then you've got only the high priest risking his life to go into the holiest of holies. And so you had 70, you had the whole crowd following Yeshua. You had 70 disciples that Yeshua sent out, but they left him after he said, you must eat my body and drink my blood. He had his 12 disciples that went everywhere with him, but he had those three that went up the mountain with him. So this road is narrow. And so there are so many ways in which we serve God. And so the Bible is absolutely right that he will reward according to your works. And some people, the fire will reveal that they've built only with straw and wood. And the fire will burn it up, but they themselves will be plucked out of the fire. But some, the fire will reveal their work was done with gold and silver, and the fire will only refine and purify that. It will not burn it up, and they will receive their reward. And we can, you know, thinking about myself, I never put myself even close to any of these men that Hebrews 11 has talked about. We have absolutely no idea what is still lying ahead for us. And maybe one day we'll, we'll sit around the Sukkot, you know, tabernacle fires uh, late at night. And we listen to the stories of all these brave, valiant men of David. But they might even tell us, no, we don't want to tell you our stories. We want to hear from you who served God in the end days, willing to do everything we did and so much more, standing up to the beast system, being willing to not buy and sell, not be able to even survive running away and hiding in caves and then being caught and taken to prison and witnessing and testifying in front of the whole world. Maybe some destined to die in prison, some destined to lose their heads, some destined to witness to the synagogues and the governments of the world, some destined for torture, some destined to survive and see Yeshua come on the clouds. That's why the millennium is going to be a thousand years. Because we want to hear your stories, three valiant men of David. But they will say, no, 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 we want to hear your stories. Your stories, valiant end day saints of Yeshua. And then we're going to have the disciples joining us around the fire. We want to hear your story. John, Peter, Paul, come on. And they'll say, no, 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 there's enough time. You tell us, how was it? How was it in the end days when the beast governments of the world persecuted your friends, your family, brother against brother, and you were able to stand strong? not being scared of them who can kill the body, but fearing your King David more, loving him more, wanting to give him a sip of water from the wells of Bethlehem. You were willing to do all that in spite of the whole world who tells you you're crazy, you're wrong. There's the Messiah. How can you be so stupid? And they went out. They would like love to hear our stories. We'd love to hear their stories. So, so Father gives us a thousand years with Yeshua. And then when Yeshua comes to the fire and he sits with us and with his disciples and with, with David and David's valiant men, and then we all just fall on our faces and we all just want to give him a sip of the fresh, beautiful water from Bethlehem's wells. And we all just want to take our crowns, if we receive any, and we just want to throw it before him. 
and all he wants is to just drink us in. Like the thirsty King David was longing for the water from Bethlehem.